2 Corinthians chapter 13. We're beginning a new series this morning. I think it is perhaps one of the most important series that we will ever do while I'm here as your pastor. And the series is based on the command of God given in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Paul is writing this to the Christians at Corinth, and he gives them what I think to be a very sobering word. It might even be frightening to some of us. It's in verse 5 of chapter 13 of 2 Corinthians. Let me ask you to stand in respect for the Word of God while I read verse 5. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test. You may be seated. Paul gives us in this one verse two commands. As I have said to you before, the Greek language of the New Testament is a much more precise language than our English language is. You may have taken Latin while you were in high school, and you remember how in Latin the way a word ends tells you a lot about that word. Now in English, if the word yourself were there, it would only be one, singular. But we spell it different when we want you to know it's plural. And so we drop the Y and add V-E-S. So it's a whole different spelling. But the word test remains the same, whether it's a suggestion that you test yourself or a wish, I wish you'd test yourself, or a command, I command you test yourself. But in the Greek language, it's spelt different for each one of those. And so when Paul wants them to know it's a command, he spells the word in a way that commands are spelt. The way it's ended. It's called the imperative mood. And so that leaves no ambiguity. If we were simply looking at this verse in the English, we wouldn't know for sure if Paul was making a suggestion, if he was making a statement, if he was wishing we would do this, or if he were commanding that we do it. But there's no question about it in the original. It's a command. Two commands. Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine is an imperative verb as well. He's saying God commands that we test ourselves to see if we're in the faith that we examine ourselves. That word examine means to put something to the test to prove its worthiness. I call it the consumer reports word. Some of you have seen consumer report magazines, right? And what it does is it lists different products that they have put through the ringer, so to speak. I mean, they have tested these products, they have, have, have jarred them, they've dropped them, they've done all these sort of things to them. They put them to the test for what purpose? To show if they're worthy or not. And if they will rate these various appliances or cars or whatever they're, they might be rating, they rate them according to how they have stood the test, how they have been examined and the results. Well, this is the word that Paul uses here, examine yourself. It was used in the classical Greek of the exam that a student studying to be a doctor had to take and pass before he was called doctor. And so Paul is saying we need to put ourselves to the test to see if we are indeed Christians. We need to examine ourselves to make sure 
we are in the faith. Now he was writing to the church at Corinth. To people who would say, yes, I'm a Christian. And yet he says, you must examine yourself. You need to put your life to the test and see if you're really a Christian. Now that brings us to the first question we're going to ask today. Why do we need to test ourselves? Why does God command us to test ourselves? I think there's one or two reasons. Or one of two reasons. First, a person may be saved and not have assurance of their salvation. I am convinced that it is possible for a person to be a born-again believer and yet because of false, faulty teaching that they've received along the way, they don't have assurance that they're a Christian. I had a great aunt. Uh, who was a Methodist, grew up in the Methodist church. And the Methodist uh, taught at that time that you could lose your salvation, that there was no assurance of salvation. And though this lady was a godly lady, loved Jesus, prayed regularly, bore the fruit that she was born again, she didn't have assurance because she was taught all her life, you can't know for sure. Now, over in 1 John chapter 3, we read these words. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, why would John write to these people, these Christians, that they could know they have eternal life if there were not some doubting, (laughs) if there were not some that didn't have the assurance? And so there were believers there who didn't have the assurance that they were saved. And so John says, now I'm writing these things to you so that you can know that if you believe in the name of the Son of God, the person of the Son of God, you can know you have eternal life. You don't have to wonder about it. You can have assurance. God intends for every child of His to have the assurance that they are born again, are members of His kingdom, children of His, and have a place in heaven. That's the heritage of every child of God. He wants you to have that assurance. He desires for you and I to have that assurance. And that brings us to a statement that I want us to remember throughout this series. Salvation is is based on grace and faith. For by grace have you been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, but a gift of God. And so the basis, the foundation for your salvation is God's grace and your faith. All right? Make no mistake about that. You're not earning your salvation. You cannot do anything to earn it. Faith and grace. But the assurance of your salvation is based on faith and a changed life. See that? Now we're not talking about your salvation. That's settled by faith and grace. But I am talking about your assurance that you're saved. How you can know you're saved is your faith in what God says Plus, you have a changed life. You look at your life, and it gives evidence. It gives fruit that you're saved. And so Paul can say, test yourself. Examine your life. See if you're bearing fruit that you're indeed born again. See if there's a changed life. That's the only way you can have assurance that you're saved. Now, the changed life does not save you, right? Faith and grace saves you. But the changed life is there because you are saved. I tell people, you don't work to go to heaven. You work because you are going to heaven, right? The changed life is there because you have been born again. 
And so you need to test yourself because you might really be saved and just not have the assurance. But secondly, and more dangerously, it's also possible to not be saved and have false assurance. To think you are a Christian, but in reality you are not. You know, to call yourself a Christian doesn't make you any more a Christian than to call yourself a millionaire makes you a millionaire, right? To be born in a Christian home doesn't make you a Christian any more than being born in a barn makes you a cow, right? To join a church doesn't make you a Christian any more than joining the Lions Club makes you a lion, right? And so it's possible to have a false assurance. Now look over in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, where Jesus speaks the most frightening words He ever spoke to those of us who think we're Christians. Look at what He says. He's talking about the final judgment day. He says in Matthew seven twenty one, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. You mean not everybody that says Jesus is Lord is saved? That's what Jesus says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many, not a few, not some, not several, but many, That's the most frightening word of all in this passage. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Here they are standing before Jesus on the judgment day and they're saying, but but, but Lord, we went out and preached in your name. We even did miracles in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We were active in church. We taught Sunday school. We were deacons. We were preachers. And what would Jesus say? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. I never had a personal saving relationship with you. All you did was know about me. You didn't really know me. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now those are frightening words, aren't they? Several years ago, we had a lady named Sue Bishop. Some of you remember Sue. She came to our church. She was probably in her late 60s, early 70s. She'd grown up down in LaGrange. She'd grown up in a Christian family. She'd been a member of a church down there for years and years. Her husband had been a deacon in the church. She considered herself to be a Christian. But she came to West Side. She started attending our church. She started getting involved in our Sunday school classes and getting to know our people. And she realized, hey, these people got something I don't have. Man, they talk to Jesus like he's really there. They pray like they're really talking to him. She realized she only knew about him. In their 70-something years of age, she came to know Jesus personally and got saved. So you see, it's very possible. Many will say to me on that day. That's why we need to examine ourselves to make sure We're not in that many who will be surprised on the day of judgment. People who died thinking they had one foot in heaven when in reality they had both feet in hell. That's why God commands us, examine yourself, test yourself to see if you are in the faith, to see if you are really a Christian. 
Billy Graham said a number of years ago that he believed 60% of the people sitting in any given church or in the churches of America on any given Sunday morning were not Christians. 60%. Now that takes in all different groups. I don't think it's that high in our congregation, but I believe as some of us here that are not Christians, and we think we are. We need to examine ourselves. Now the second question is this. Why are these tests valid? Why are the tests valid that we're going to be looking at? The 11 tests of saving faith. Why are they valid? First of all, they are valid because when Jesus enters your life, it must change. You remember what Paul says in 2 Corinthians, the verse we saw in 13, verse 5? He says that Jesus Christ is in you. All right? If you are a Christian, Jesus is in you in the person of His Holy Spirit. Now, there's no way the God of the universe can invade your life and you stay the same. There's got to be some changes. It's like that old cesspool. Filthy, murky, Water that's stagnant and smelly. That's us before Jesus, right? Now, if you take a drill and you drill down through the middle of that cesspool and you keep going until you hit hit an artesian well and then that fresh artesian well water starts spewing up in that cesspool, what's going to happen? Eventually. That old fresh water is going to keep boiling up. It's going to push that stagnant cesspool water over the sides, and if that pool just, that artesian well keeps on going, you know what, it's going to finally change the character of that old pool, and it's not going to be a cesspool anymore, is it? It's going to be fresh water, drinking water. That's what Jesus does when he comes into our life. He's like that artesian well, and there's no way the living Christ can indwell within our lives and there not be a change. And there not be some evidence of that change. So that's one reason the tests are valid. Because if Christ is in you, there are going to be changes. Secondly, there must be a changed life because God is the one who's bringing the change. If it was you and me bringing it, it might be suspect. But it's not us bringing it. Look in Philippians 1.6. Paul says, For I am confident of this very thing. In other words, Paul might be saying, you know, there are some things I'm just not sure about. There are other things that, you know, I'm fairly certain about. But now let me tell you something I am absolutely 100% sure about. I am absolutely confident about this thing. You can take it to the bank. And what is it? that He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Man. He who began the good work. And who began the work? You or Jesus? God began it. He began the good work in you. And what's He going to do? He's going to continue that work. And what is that work? Making you like Jesus. Right? Perfecting your faith. So, If God who is in you is going to continue to work in you until the day Jesus comes back, then how can you have Him in you through His Spirit and me not see some change in your life? That you not see some change in your life. can't happen. So the tests are valid. Look also at Philippians 2.13. Paul says, For it is God who is at work in you. Who's working in you? Yourself? God. It's God who's at work in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Both to will, give you the will, the desire. To work, to bring about it in you. Now how can God be at work in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure and you not change? That your life not be different? Can't be. Also, In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 
Paul says, but by the grace of God. Remember, God's grace is His enabling power. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Paul says, God's grace made me what I am. And I worked like a Trojan, but you know, it wasn't really me even working. It was God working in me. Right? It was His grace enabling me to even work. Now, how can this be true of a believer and there not be a change in your life when you become a believer? Thirdly, the test of valid, not only because Christ is in you and God's bringing about the change, but also when you become a Christian, you're a new creature in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore... If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. So when you're a Christian, God says you're a new creature. You're a new creation. Old things passed away. New things have come. Now, if new things are coming in your life, because you are a new creature, how can I not see those in your life? How can you be a new creature and be the same as you were before? And then a saving faith will produce fruit. James talks about this over in the second chapter of his letter. He says, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? And the indication is, the answer is no, it cannot. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, for what use is that? Even so, if, no, if one has no works, that faith is dead, being by itself. So Paul says, excuse me, James says, if your faith doesn't produce a change, if it doesn't produce some fruit, it's dead. And if it's dead, it's not a saving faith. It's only intellectual faith. Look at what he says in verse 19. You believe that God is one? Oh, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Here's talking about the intellectual faith that knows the facts, that knows Jesus came and lived on the earth, perfect life, knows He died on the cross, knows He came alive from the dead. They know all about Jesus. The devil knows all about Him. The demons know all about Him and they shudder. Because there is no personal relationship that produces a changed life. There's not a living faith. Now having said that, let me give you one more statement you need to keep in mind. We're not talking about a life marked by perfection. But a life marked by consistency and growth. I'm not saying you've got to be perfect. You never will be. But your life should be characterized by growth in Christ and consistency. Okay, that's what we're talking about. As we look at these 11 tests of saving faith, I believe you should see some glimmer at least, some glimpse of every one of them in your life. Some you will see more than others. But I believe you should be able to see almost all somewhere, it's, even if it's small, in your life. But if we look at these 11 tests of saving faith and you do not see them in your life, then you have every reason to believe you're not saved. You have no assurance. And I encourage you to seek God for salvation. Now the first test we will look at today. And that first test is simply this. 
A person desires to walk in the light and in fellowship with God. And we find this over in 1 John. All of our 11 tests come out of the the book of 1 John. 1 John is written primarily to people who had made a false division between what you think and how you live. They basically thought if you believe right, that's what really matters. Then how you live is not that important. That's just part of this old world. It's the spiritual world and what you think and believe that's really important. And they separated your belief system from how you lived. I see a lot of people doing that today, particularly young people who come and sit in church every Sunday, go to Sunday school, and then go out and get drunk on the weekend. There's an inconsistency there. And if you talk to them, well, but I believe Jesus is God's Son. I believe in Jesus as my Savior. I go to church. I've been baptized. I'm a member. And John writes to people who are having that impression. He says, look, don't, don't deceive yourself, buddy. Uh-uh. He who practices lawlessness is of the devil. He who is of God will practice righteousness. So don't deceive yourself. You can't separate the way you live from the way you believe. Because what you really believe is what you live, not what you say with your lips. So this first test is found in 1 John chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 5 through 7. This is the message we have heard from Him and announced to you, that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him, that is, we're Christians, right? We have fellowship with God. If we say that and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. That simple. I don't care what you say with your mouth. If you're not living it, it's a lie. You know what he's saying? But, verse 7, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. We have fellowship with God. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So God says, if you are a Christian, you will have a desire to walk in the light and in fellowship with God. Now in the Bible, light equates to truth. Light equates to righteousness. You see in your Bible, probably light is capitalized, isn't it? So there it seems to be referring to Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Who said, I am the light of the world. Right? So it means to walk in Jesus. A born-again person will have the disposition, the lifestyle, the attitude, the commitment to maintain fellowship with a holy God. Because we are new creatures, because we are born again to know God, we will want to walk in His light in keeping with Jesus, and who is truth. Well, what does it mean to walk in the light? If you are a true believer, a true Christian, you will desire to walk in the light and have fellowship with God. Well, preacher, what does it mean to walk in the light? How can I know? I'm going to tell you three things. First, it means you practice the truth. Look in verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If you're a true believer, you practice the truth. What does that mean? That means that you love the truth like God loves the truth. God cannot lie. God is ultimate truth, ultimate reality. And therefore, as a child of His, you too will love the truth. That means you will see yourself as God sees you. How does God see you? He sees you as helpless apart from Him. Did not Jesus say, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me shall bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. We'll realize we're totally dependent on our Lord to do all and to be all in us and for us. 
To walk in the truth means that we see life from God's perspective. And what is God's perspective? That God's in control of all things, and He works all things after the counsel of His will. God's perspective is that God causes all things to work together for good to those that love Him, to those that are called according to His purpose, meaning no matter what happens to me, how tragic it might appear, if I am a child of God, He's promised He will bring good in that, that He'll work to His glory and my good. It means not only that we see ourselves as God sees us, that we see life as God sees life, but it means we seek truth in personal relationships. That means we're a person of honesty. We're a person of integrity. A non-Christian, they won't communicate in truth many times. They'll lie. They'll say what's most convenient for them to say. They won't be a person of integrity. They'll gossip. They will habitually tell lies. So first you practice the truth. Secondly, you practice righteousness. In Verse 2, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 29 of 1 John. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who also who practices righteousness is born of him. What does it mean to practice righteousness? It means to recognize that we want to bring our lives up to the level of God's word. Now, we're not talking about positional righteousness. When you become a Christian, God declares you righteous in His sight. Now, we're not talking about that. We're talking about your personal righteousness. We're talking about your experiential righteousness. We means bringing up your life to the level of your position. That means living like a Christian, living according to God's Word. That's what righteousness is. And so, if you are a true believer, you want to live in agreement with God's Word. You want your life to be an example of personal righteousness. You want to live in a way that's pleasing to God. You desire for every area of your life to be pleasing to God. Right? If you are a true Christian, you sin all you want to. In fact, you sin more than you want to because you don't want to sin at all. A person who's thinking, well, now, how much can I sin and get by with? <laughs> That's an indication you're not a believer at all. Because a true believer doesn't want to sin any. He wants his life to be totally righteous. He desires, he hungers to live in the righteousness of God. He prays, God, bring up my life to the level of your word. I know I fall short, but I don't want to. Work that righteousness in me. I want to be holy before you. I want to live a life that's pleasing to you in every respect. A true believer desires to reflect the righteousness of Christ. Now, a non-believer, a person who just says they're a Christian and is not, won't desire to grow spiritually, they're complacent with where they are. They have the thought that says something like this, well, I go to church every now, well, probably two or three times a month. And I throw a few dollars in the offering plate. I can do everything God wants. I can do what I want the rest of the time. Right? There's no desire to grow deeper and deeper in Christ's likeness. There's no interest in having God scrutinize their life. Over in Psalm 139, David wrote, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there is any hurtful way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. A person who's not a Christian, they won't pray that prayer honestly, sincerely. They don't want God to search them. You know, God, leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. You know, I'll do my thing, and, 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 and I know you'll you be happy with that, right? I'll give you my one hour a week, and, and you'll be happy. I can go out and live like I want to the rest of the week. A person who is a nominal Christian only, name only Christian, has no problem coming to church on Sunday and then leaving church and going home to an immoral relationship, living with somebody that's not even their spouse, or cheating on their wife. Churches are filled with people like that. 
You desire to walk in righteousness. Last week when we had the Lord's Supper, we took time to go through and look at the Lordship of Jesus. You remember? Now, a person who's not really a Christian, they didn't like that. They were thinking about something else. I'm not going to do this. And they were thinking about what they were going to do Sunday afternoon. Or they were thinking about what they did Saturday night. Or they were thinking about the Falcon game that was coming on. I mean, they were doing anything but thinking about what I was talking about. They were doing anything but letting Christ examine their life. Because they didn't really want Jesus to be Lord in every area of their life. They don't want to give it up. But a person who is truly a believer wants Christ to be Lord of all. As much as it hurts, as painful as it is, they wanted Jesus to examine their life and show them areas that were not pleasing to Him. So a true believer will practice righteousness as well as practice the truth. And what does it mean to walk in the light? Thirdly, it means to love purity. In chapter 3 of 1 John, verses 2 and 3, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we'll be like Him, because we will see Him as He is. And everyone who has His hope fixed on Him purifies himself, just as He is pure. Jesus is pure in character. A born-again Christian will also desire to overcome personal sin. He will not be satisfied to have sin in his life. He desires to eradicate it. He desires for it to be gone. And he will deal with his sins specifically before God. As 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. A true believer will bring his sin before God and confess it. He'll say, God, this is sin, and I don't want it in my life. Take it away. An unbeliever, he'll try to rationalize away sin in his life. Look in verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. Verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. That's exactly what unbelievers do. Non-Christian, a person who's a name-only Christian, they rationalize away their sin. They lie and say, well, it's okay. I mean, everybody does it. It's right to cheat on your income tax. I mean, the government expects you to, right? They know you're going to do it. That's why they set the table so high. They say you rationalize away. So they're dealing with your sin. You try to push it aside. Well, it's okay. Everybody does it. It's just me. I'm just that way. You know, I just... One of my, everybody's got to have some faults, right? I just happen to be mine. i got a short temper. I, can't, I was born that way. My dad was that way. So I can't help it. All right? So what do you do? Rationalize. You say you have no sin. <laughs> and what does God say about that? Uh-uh. He's a liar. The truth is not in him. A true believer says, God, show me my sin, and I want to confess it and bring it before you. I'm not perfect. I know I'm not perfect. But I don't want that sin in my life. I desire for you to to root it out, to burn it out with your holiness. So what's the first test of saving faith? You desire to walk in the light and have fellowship with God. As you look at your life, are you practicing the truth? Seeking to be a person of integrity, honesty? Are you practicing righteousness? Seeking to live according to God's Word, unsatisfied with errors of your life that are not what He would want? Do you love purity? Do you deal with sin God's way? Test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. It's God's command. Will you do it? Let's pray. We do welcome you, and I'm glad that you have taken the opportunity to listen to a sermon on our Internet. And I want you just to know that uh, everybody in the church is not like me. Uh, I have these fellows up here, our leadership team, Uh, This is Filiberto Medina, who is our Hispanic pastor. 
And our Hispanic congregation meets every Sunday evening at 6.30. This is Paul Kumar. He is our Minister of Community Connections. Uh, and to my left is Mark Baker, who heads up our Reformers Unanimous Ministry, which is a Christian addiction recovery program that meets every Friday night at 7 o'clock. So if you live in the Mableton area, uh, and it doesn't matter what race you're from, it doesn't matter your cultural background, I want you to know you are welcome at Westside Church. This is where everybody is somebody and Jesus is Lord. Hope you'll join us soon. Thank you for being with us for this message. Each week, Dr. Stewart gives practical applications and ways to live out the Word of God. If you would like more information, please take a moment to view our website at wbcfamily.org. That's wbcfamily.org. Dot org.